The reading uh, this afternoon is really at the end of Acts chapter 4 uh, and into Acts chapter 5. We'll just really uh, go through the verses more or less sort of verse by verse. Uh, we're just working our way uh, slowly uh, through the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we've a long way to go, uh, but it's exciting days. Uh, everything is new. Everything is fresh. Uh, everything is alive in the power of the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have noted the, the first message that was preached after the uh, giving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have thought of the first converts to the gospel. We have thought of the first church being formed in Jerusalem, comprising of over 3,000 people. And then we've thought, we thought last week of the, the first opposition. Uh, the, the week before, we thought about the first miracle, uh, the raising of the, the lame man that was uh, lying at the uh, beautiful gate of the temple. Then we saw the, the first opposition, the first imprisonment, and then the first threats that were made uh, against the preaching of the early apostles. Uh, and so what we're going to look at this afternoon uh, from verse 23 of chapter 4 is the moment when uh, Peter and John were released from prison. And we'll see what their uh, instinctive reaction to that release was. We'll think about where they went, and then we'll also think about what they did. And uh, we'll think about the prayer that was offered uh, by the believers, uh, the uh, content of that prayer. And then we'll think of the request that was made, and we'll think about the response that was, that was made. Uh, and then as we come into chapter 5, we'll think of that very, very solemn incident in the life of the early church when uh, God moves. He moves in power. Uh, not the power that brought life uh, as the gospel was preached in the streets of Jerusalem, but the power that brought death. Uh, to the, those in the church that sinned and lied against the Holy Spirit. So that is really going to be the content of our message this afternoon. So in verse number 23, uh, we read that they were let go. They were let go and they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. So we notice that when they were released from prison, they're instinct was to seek out their own company. They just had that desire to be again in the fellowship, the immediate fellowship of the other believers uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, William MacDonald said that one test of a Christian's character is where he finds fellowship and companionship. And these disciples of the Lord Jesus, Peter and John, having spent a night in prison, being released, in spite of all the threatenings that had been made against them and the pressure that had been put upon them, their desire was just to be found again among the other disciples, the other believers. And we'll notice that as they were found together, when they heard, when the other disciples heard all that had happened, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. So their first instinct was to uh, go to their own people. And together, their instinct was to lift up their voices in prayer to God. And you know, the big question, of course, really is when we find ourselves in straitened circumstances, when we find ourselves under pressure, whatever that pressure might be, whether it's persecution, opposition, or whether it's just the trials and sufferings and circumstances of life, where do we find our solace? Where do we find our comfort? Where do we find our strength? Who do we resort to? Where do we resort to? As we mentioned the quote from MacDonald, he said, you know, a Christian's character, one test of his character, is where he finds fellowship and companionship. And surely, brothers and sisters, when we find ourselves in difficulties in the course of our life, our first instinct should be to meet with other believers and share with other believers the things that we are passing through. And Peter and John, they did exactly that. 
They found the disciples and they shared all that had happened. And then with one accord, they lifted up their voice unto God. So they were not only together, but they were together in prayer and in worship to God. And you know, brothers and sisters, that really should be our first instinct, not only in times of difficulty to gather together, but as we gather together to raise our united voice in worship and praise and adoration to God and to bring our requests to God. And so having reported everything to the disciples, they then laid out everything before God and they looked to God for God's intervention in the circumstances that they found themselves in. And brothers and sisters, that should be my reaction and yours, that we should constantly be seeking out the fellowship of believers. And in that fellowship, as we report all that is happening in our life, then together we can come with one accord into the presence of the Lord. We noticed in earlier studies of that little expression, one accord, one accord, one accord. And it's beautiful just to see the, the unity that existed in the church in these early days. And we, we've thought before of the, the heart cry of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 17 as he cries to the Father and he says, oh, that they might be one. Oh, that they might be one, even as you and I are one. The heart cry of Christ is for his people to be united. You ever wonder about the heartbreaking of Christ? As he looks in this world that is uh, with people here and there that belong to him, but there's disunity, there's separation, there's division. And what a, a grief it must be to the heart of Christ uh, to see his own, rather than being united together as he is united to the Father. He sees them split asunder and he sees them gathering here, there and everywhere. And he sees this disunity among his people. But here in the early church, there was a unity, a glorious unity. Oh, that we might recapture something of the unity of the early church. But if we, as we, because if we capture something of the unity of the early church, we'll maybe know something of the power and the effectiveness of the early church as well. And so there they are, they're gathered uh, with, 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 with the church there in Jerusalem. We thought of the contrast. They had come from that which was rationalistic and they come into a realm that is spiritual. No longer are they in the midst of their foes, but they're with their friends. They're no longer in the, in the, the presence of the Sanhedrin that rejected them, but they're now in the presence of the Almighty God who accepts them in his beloved Son. What a difference, what a contrast. And they've come away from the place of rejection. They've come into the place of acceptance. Not only acceptance by their fellow believers, but acceptance by their God in heaven. And here we have in, in these verses that follow in Acts chapter 4, we've got the first prayer. Not the first time they prayed, but we've got the first recorded prayer uh, of, the, of, of the disciples in the New Testament. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, just to go, go through the New Testament and, and look at the prayers, the prayers that are written down for us, for our instruction. We've already alluded to the, the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus in, in, in John 17. You know, Father, I have finished the work that I have uh, finished the work that you gave me to do. I've glorified your name and how he prays for his own. And he prays ultimately that we may behold his glory. It's wonderful just to read the prayers of the New Testament, the prayer of the Lord Jesus, the prayers of Paul that we find in his epistles. And here we've got this united prayer of these early disciples. It's a prayer that is full of worship. It's full of appreciation and adoration for God. And it's full of appreciation and adoration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting just to see the, the, the scope of, of, the, of the, the worship of, of these early Christians. Think of their appreciation of God. You know, he says in, the, in verse number 24, uh, in the middle of the verse, it says they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and says, Lord, Lord, thou art 
God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Lord. It's interesting that the word that is used uh, there in, in verse 24 is an, an unusual word. It, it's, it's a word that is used to uh, indicate a, a supreme Lord, a supreme master. One that is Lord over all lords. Uh, it's just not in contrast to, to, to where they had just been. And we think of those religious leaders, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, and they thought that they were lords, and they thought that they were rulers, and they were dictating their terms to Peter and John as they made threats against them and commanded them not to preach in the name of Jesus. And here these are disciples, and they rehearse all that has happened, and unitedly they come into the presence of God, and they say, Lord, you are the supreme ruler. You're the supreme master. You're the one. You're the one that we take our orders from. We don't bow to the threatenings of men. We don't succumb to the pressure that men place us under. We recognize you, O oh God, as supreme ruler, master of all. O oh, brothers and sisters, that we might have that appreciation of God that he is Lord, sovereign, Lord, Lord above all lords, and that we would gladly bow to his authority in our lives. We're living in days, you know, when uh, even in our land, in the Western world, I know our dear brothers in India have known something of persecution uh, in, in their country uh, and restrictions placed on the, the preaching of the gospel. And that is a, something that is sweeping across the world. And how we, need to, how we need to recognize that the one who's commissioned us to go and to preach and to serve and to live for his glory is the one that is sovereign above all sovereigns. He's the one that is Lord. And he reminds us as well that he's not only God, but he's the one that has created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And you're they're just taken up with the vastness and the glory and the might and the majesty of God. Why would they ever bow to the dictates of puny man? Why would they ever succumb to the threatenings of these religious leaders when they were able to enter into the presence of God, the God of all creation? And so they recognized his sovereignty. Uh, notice too that they recognize his governing hand in the affairs of life. That yes, he's not only a supreme God in all his majesty and his sovereignty, but he's a God that is involved in the circumstances of life. And he takes us back to Calvary in, in, in verse number, in, in, in verse number uh, 25, 26, 27. You know, he, 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 they're really saying, you know, all that's happened to us, you know, it was all prophesied. You know, and what happened to Christ, that was all prophesied. You know, they, they really believed that they were, they were living in days when there was the fulfillment of, 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 of Holy Scripture. Prophecy was being fulfilled before their very eyes. They were experiencing it. They were in the midst of it. And they were thrilled by it. And, you know, the quotes in, in verse number uh, 25 and 26, they're quoting from, the, from the, the Old Testament Psalms, from Psalm 22, from the mouth of David. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And they're thinking back to Calvary. They're thinking back to the, the scenes, the dark scenes of Golgotha. And they're thinking back to the judgment hall of Pilate and the rulers and the kings of the earth. And they're all gathered together against the Christ. And, you know, they say that's all just the fulfillment of prophecy. You know, it's, 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 it's just the hand of God working in the affairs of men. He's the God in heaven, and yet he's the God that moves on earth to fulfill his purpose. And they knew having listened to the, the prophetic words of the Lord Jesus, that what men did to him, they would do to them. And that was being fulfilled in their own experience, and they're rejoicing in that. Well, brothers and sisters, we can rejoice in the fact that God is working out his purposes on earth. And the kings might rage, 
and the heathen might gather and all the nations might gather together against the Christ and they will do. And just as these early Christians were persecuted, there's coming a day when we well might be persecuted, but we can rejoice in the midst of it. It's prophesied. And all the help that we require to stand against it will be given to us. And we can rejoice that God's sovereign hand is working out his purposes on earth. God is in control. I know we look around us today and it's chaos. And people's hearts are filled with anxiety and fear and what's going to happen next. And, and there's all the problems with COVID and all the rest of the stuff that's happening in the world. But let's rejoice. God is sovereign. God is working out his purposes. We can trust in him. We can rejoice in him, regardless of the hardships and the sorrows and the sufferings that we're going through. And so they're, they're rejoicing in the sovereignty of God. They're rejoicing that God is working out his purposes. In fact, he says in verse number uh, 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 um, 28, he he said, you know, he says, for to do, they were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Isn't that not amazing? You know, earlier on when they were speaking to the, the members of the Sanhedrin, And they were speaking about the death of the Lord Jesus. And they basically laid it at their doors. Remember they'd said in Acts chapter 2. When they're preaching to the multitudes in the streets of Jerusalem. They says you crucified him. But you know when they're speaking to these religious leaders. They said no it was you that crucified him. It was you. It was you that put him to death. You're responsible for the death of Christ. And you know they're no longer standing in the presence of the crowd in the street, and they're no longer standing in the presence of the Sanhedrin, but they're standing in the presence of Almighty God, and they say, listen, it was your hand. It was your hand. It was the hand of God. God was behind it all. It isn't wonderful just to think of the amazing outworking of God's divine purpose, that God purposed that his own blessed son, his holy servant Jesus, as you'll speak about, as they'll speak about in this chapter, that God sent him, God sent him to go to that cross. And there he was, there he was put to death for you and for me, the hand of God, God sending forth his son in order to accomplish his purpose and giving his life as an offering for our sin. And the rejoicing that God was at work, that God was at work at Calvary and God was at work in their life. And just as blessing flowed from the hand of God working at Calvary, they're looking for the hand of God to move in blessing at his working in their lives as well. And so they appreciated, they appreciated the sovereignty of God. They appreciated the governing hand of God, even in the minutiae of life, as God moves the hearts of men in Jerusalem to call for the death of his son. And on that cross, as men put him to death, God was working out his amazing plan of redemption. George Matheson said this, the effort, their effort of opposition to the divine will proved to be a stroke of, of alliance with it. They met together in a council of war against Christ. Unconsciously to themselves, they signed a treaty for the promotion of Christ's glory. Our God does not beat down the storms that rise against him, but he rides upon them and he works through them for his own glory. Brothers and sisters, regardless of what happens in our lives, we can rejoice that the hand of God is working, working all things out together for good to to them that love him. He's working out his purpose in order that he might be eternally glorified. But not only did they have an appreciation of God, but they had an appreciation of Christ. You know, they appreciated his sinlessness. In verse 27 and verse 30, uh, they make the same statement. They speak about his holiness. Uh, I know the authorized would say holy child. Uh, Other translations would say holy servant. The holiness, the holiness of Christ, the sinlessness of Christ. It's interesting, in this chapter, you've got, a, you've got a, 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 a holy servant and you've got a holy spirit and you've got a holy church. 
Brothers and sisters, everything at the beginning was marked by absolute holiness. That's why you've got the severity of the incident in chapter 5, because there was something that tarnished the holiness of God's church. And God acted severely and solemnly and suddenly in judgment against it. The church, Holy Spirit, Holy Servant, Holy Church. And that church was being besmirched by the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. And God moves. God moves to preserve the holiness of his church, of his people here on earth. But they appreciated the sinlessness of Christ, the holiness of Christ. They appreciated the messiahship of Christ. In verse number 26, as we've already alluded to from the Psalms, uh, the, the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, his Messiah, his anointed one. You see, that was a big problem for Peter and John when the Lord Jesus Christ was here on earth. You know, they were looking for the Messiah. They believed he was the Messiah, but they were looking for a kingdom. They were looking for the Lord Jesus to defeat the Romans and to set up a kingdom and they were going to reign with him. They were even arguing some of the disciples who would be in the right hand and who would be in the left hand. They were looking for a reigning Messiah and they couldn't get their heads around a suffering Messiah. It didn't matter how many times the Lord Jesus told them that he would suffer. They didn't get it. But they've got it now. They've got it now. And there's no doubt in the minds of the disciples that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. Yeah, he suffered and he died. But that was all part of God's plan of bringing redemption, not just to the nation of Israel, but ultimately redemption that would be offered to all nations through faith in the crucified, yet risen and exalted Lord Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah of God. And so they realized his sinlessness, they realized his messiahship, and they realized his victory. In verse number 30, uh, you know, as as they pray that, that he might stretch forth his hand and heal, and that signs and wonders might be done by the name of, of thy holy servant Jesus. And you know, they just, they just want that the, the, the victories, the fruit of the victory of Christ might be, might be spread abroad, might be known of all, that the one that was crucified and buried was raised and exalted and is alive, alive in the power of glorious victory, and he's able to triumph over every foe, and that signs and wonders would be done in his name. They've got an appreciation of God. They've got an appreciation of Christ. Brothers and sisters, these two things are foundational in our Christian life. Right thoughts about God and right thoughts about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Brothers and sisters, let's, 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 let's fear the Lord. Let's reverence the Lord. Let us have high and holy thoughts about God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verses 29, we've got the request that they make in prayer. Verse number 29, they say, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and so on. Behold their threatenings. You know, they don't ask that the threatenings would cease. Peter and John are not asking that the persecution would disappear and that they might be that they might be accepted and that they might be popular among men. <laughs> They're not praying for that. <laughs> they know that that is an impossibility. That that's just not going to happen. They know that persecution will rise a wave after wave upon them. And so all they're saying to God is, God, behold, behold the threatenings. Look on the threatenings. Look on this, these waves of opposition that are coming against us. Behold, they are, they, are, they, are, they are threatenings. And let us be bold. Behold them and let us be bold. Let us be bold in our declaration of your word. Let us be bold in order that we might speak forth your truth with absolute clarity, with courage, and with commitment, with confidence. They're really praying for more of the very thing that that got them into trouble in the first place. (laughs) The reason they were dragged before the Sanhedrin, 
realized this, the reason they stood in the dock was because of their boldness. Their boldness in declaring the gospel. And as they stood before the Sanhedrin, the thing that they marveled at was their boldness. And Peter and John are saying, oh God, just give us more of this boldness. This boldness that brought about the hostility of men against us. Give us more boldness in order that we may continue to declare your truth regardless of the opposition and regardless of the possibility of further persecution. Just give us boldness. Brothers and sisters, we need, a, we need boldness. Oh, church, arise, was the words of the song that we, that we played at the beginning. Oh, church, arise. You know, I wonder at times if the, the church is just like a sleeping giant that's just been lulled to sleep in the arms of an enemy. And we need to arise, arise from our slumber and to be bold and to declare with courage and clarity and commitment and confidence the glorious truth of the gospel. The world needs the gospel. Our neighbors need the gospel. Our community need the gospel. Or know that we might be men and women that are marked by boldness in declaring the truth of God. We notice too that he asked that he might stretch forth his hand. Remember we talked about the hand of God in relation to Calvary. You know that the, the rulers were gathered together and, and, and they did all that, that his hand, that the hand of God had determined to be done. And there's in that hand that moves sovereignly through the, the opposition, the rejection, the crucifixion of Christ. May that same hand be in operation in our lives, in our ministry. And through that, may your hand work these mighty miracles in order that men and women might believe. What a prayer. What a prayer. Not praying for suffering to cease. Not praying to be released from the trying circumstances, but praying that the name of God, the name of his holy servant, Jesus, would be vindicated and glorified and them living in perpetual victory as they declare the gospel. Notice the response to the prayer. Verse 31, the place was shaken. Verse 31, the people were filled. Verse, verse 31, again at the end, the preaching was bold. Verse 32, possessions were shared. And verse 33, power was exhibited. Power was exhibited. Oh, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but, but I would covet something like that in, 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 in my life and in, in my church. Just to, know, just to know the very place being shaken. That was physical. That was physical. And then the people were, were, were filled. That is spiritual. That is spiritual. Now, you know, sometimes when there's a spiritual manifestation, there's also a physical manifestation. You know, I often love to read about revivals. And think of the revival, revival off the west coast, uh, the west coast of Scotland and the islands under Duncan Campbell. And you know, as they gathered together to pray, there was times when the very foundation of the building shook with a mighty sense of the presence and the power of God. Brothers and sisters, it shook in the day of Pentecost, and here the place is shaking again as the Holy Spirit fills his servants in order that he might be emboldened to preach the word. Oh, that we would know, maybe not so much the place shaking. If God wants to shake the place, let him shake it. It's maybe us that need shaking. It's maybe me that needs shaking. Rather than the building, it's maybe our hearts that need to be awakened, that we need to arise, that our whole lives, our circumstances, maybe need to be shaken to make us more conscious of God and more desirous for the power of God, the boldness of God in our lives and in our witness. The brothers and sisters, they're all wet. I don't know about the place being shaken, but I tell you, we need, we need the people to be filled. We need the, so often we're filled by ourselves and our self-importance and our self-righteousness, oh, that we might be filled with the Spirit, men and women that are Spirit-filled and being bold in the declaration of the gospel. You know, brothers and sisters, we need not only a true appreciation of God and a true appreciation of Christ, but we need a true appreciation of the Holy Spirit 
And we need to know what it is to be filled and filled and filled and filled again day by day with the Holy Spirit. Not a new Pentecost, not a new endowment, but a new filling, a new daily anointing, constant anointing of the Holy Spirit in order that we might be what we should be for God in this world. And so we've got these men. They've just been threatened. They've just spent a night in the jail. And you know, their only passion in their hearts is to go forward. And their only fear was that they might fear and that they might fail. They just wanted, they wanted to be bold. They were conscious of their own inadequacies, conscious of the, the tendencies of their own heart might be to go back and to, and, and, and to, and to succumb to fear and terror at the hands of men. And so they're praying for boldness, boldness. They don't want to go back. They want to go forward. They want to take the whole movement of the church, the onward movement of the church. They want to be part of that. They don't want to fail. They don't want to fail God. And they want boldness. Oh, brothers and sisters, that we might have a vision. These men had a, had a vision. They were men of a vision. They were a men with a passion. Know that we might ha have that same vision and that passion today. And so we've got the... We've got the, the place being shaken. We've got the people being filled. We've got the, um, the preaching being bold. And then we've got the possessions being shared. <laughs> the possessions being shared. Uh, maybe we want the filling of the Spirit and we want the place being shaken and we want the bold preaching, but I don't know there's too many of us want the possessions being shared. <laughs> you see, the whole thing goes from the supernatural to the super practical. And you know, that really is what happens when, when hearts are really just aflame with the love of Christ. When hearts are aflame with love for our brothers and sisters, seeing them in Christ. That love, that love for Christ, that love for our brothers and sisters will, will lead to giving. It's got to. It's got to. That's got to be as, as instinctive as laying hold on God, as instinctive for the believer in the Lord Jesus, as laying hold on God in prayer should be our preparedness, our willingness to give, to meet the needs of others. What we've got in these verses is not communism. What we've got in these verses is Christianity. New Testament Christianity a people who not only love God, but a people who love each other. A people who are not only conscious of the will of God for them to proclaim the gospel, but a people who are conscious of the will of God for them to meet each other's needs in a material way. And so we read in these verses that the multitude, in verse 32, the multitude of them that believe were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was on them. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the, the, the prices of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. That was New Testament Christianity. No communism. You see, the, the principle in communism is that the, the state owns all property. All the means of production are in the hands of the state. But you know, this wasn't the this wasn't a this, this wasn't everything being in the in the hands of the state. This was individuals having their own things things that belonged to them, possessions that were theirs, land that was theirs, and they willingly, not by rule or edict, but willingly, what they had, they gave to share with others. Brothers and sisters, that's incredible, isn't it? That material fellowship was the outward sign of a spiritual fellowship. They just felt that their brothers and sisters were really part of them. And so what they would desire for themselves, they, they just wanted others 
their brothers and sisters to have and to share in them. It was a response to need. There was nobody that lacked. There was none of them were poorer than any of the rest of them. That people were all catered for as they had all things in common. You know, I read these words of F. E. Marsh, and, uh, and and he was contrasting the early church with the church of today, the Christianity of today. He said these words: "Is it not a solemn thought that if the evangelist Luke were describing modern instead of primitive Christianity, he would have to vary the pre the phraseology of Acts chapter four, verse thirty-two to thirty-five." He would maybe need to say something like this. And the multitude of them that profess were of hard heart and stony soul. And everyone said that all the things they possessed were their own. And they had all things that were in fashion. And with great power gave they witness to the attractions of this world. And great selfishness was upon them all. And there were many among them that lacked love. For as many as were possessors of lands bought more, and sometimes gave a small part thereof for a public good, so that their names were heralded in the newspapers, and distribution of praise was made to everyone according as he desired. And you know, that would really probably be a better description of Christianity and our culture here in the West, that rather than having everything in common, you know, we just want everything for ourselves. And what we have, we want to hang, to hang on to tenaciously and think that we have some kind of uh, eternal right to it. And yet these disciples were so overcome with a sense of love for each other, fellowship with each other, that what they had, they just put at the disposal to meet the needs of others. You know, fellowship really just means having all things in common. You know, someone has said that the child of God has fellowship with God. That is all things common with God. All the resources of God are at the disposal of the child of God. And all the resources of the child of God are at the disposal of God. And that is true, isn't it? You see, the very character of God is that he's a, he's a giving God. He's a sacrificing God. He's a selfless God. You know, God just gives and he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives again. He pours out for others. And brothers and sisters, if we are children of God, then we should be like God. And that selfless, giving nature of God should be seen in you and seen in me. And rather than just desiring to amass stuff for ourselves, what we do have, we should have a desire to share it for the benefit of others. Notice that they had one heart, verse 32, and they had one soul. One heart, that's the emotion. The soul is the very, is the very life. They had one heart, they had one life. You know, they, they, were, they were just caught up together in one bundle of love and one bundle of life. And that was the power that motivated that was the power that motivated them to share what they had so that none lacked in their midst. It was this motivation of being of one love and, and one mind and, and one soul, one life, one life. They were sharers together in the grace of life. And not only did we see the power that motivated them, but we see the principle that marked them. They were marked by selflessness. Not one of them said that all of the things that they possessed were their own. Brothers and sisters, these are, these are amazing things. I know the selfishness of my heart. I know that materialistic uh, thinking that is in my mind. That desire just to hold on to what's mine. What's mine. I've worked for it. It's mine. Brothers and sisters, that type of thinking was foreign to the early believers. You see, they had a, rather than a self-consciousness, they had a corporate consciousness. They were conscious that they had been brought into something that was far bigger than themselves. It wasn't all to do with them. They were brought into a body, a body. They were conscious of that which was corporate 
and the responsibility in that corporate body. Brothers and sisters, you know, we're part, we need to, I think we need a fresh understanding of the body, the body of Christ. The church is the body. Not only the relationship that we therefore have with a risen, exalted head in heaven, but the relationship and the responsibility that we have to each other. You know, you don't leave half your, half your body exposed. Naturally speaking, you know, we cover it up. We make preparation for and provision for every part of our human body. Brothers and sisters, the body exists. Every member of the human body exists for the body. It doesn't exist for itself. No part of my body exists for itself. It exists for the good and benefit of the whole. And brothers and sisters, as Christians, we're not individuals anymore. We're part of something that is corporate. And we don't exist for the benefit of ourselves, but we exist for the benefit of each other. And all that we have should be for the benefit of all our brothers and sisters. There should be that corporate consciousness. But, you know, they weren't just marked by a corporate consciousness, but, you know, they had an instinctive uh, re uh, reaction to, to the needs of others around them. They could see where there was lack. You see, they were living in and through each other. You know, Peter and John knew exactly where they would be when they were released from prison. We'll see that uh, in, 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 in subsequent chapters as well, that, that when the disciples were released from prison, they knew where to find the saints. The saints were gathered together. They were living in and out of each other. They were together, together, together. Uh, and so there was this consciousness of, of, of that which was corporate. And then there was that consciousness of where need was. And they were so quick to respond to that need in order that none of them would lack. Remember, Paul teaches us that if one suffers, then all should suffer. If one is honored, all should be honored. All should rejoice. Brothers and sisters, there needs to be that consciousness of that which is corporate. And there needs to be that consciousness of need that exists. You see, if a member of my body is suffering, then my whole body knows about it. In fact, if there's a member of my body suffering, then the whole world knows about it. Uh, but, you know, we, we, you know when, when there's a part of our body suffers, you know, instinctively, the, that, that suffering, it, it's then every part of the body knows about it. As it's all connected. And brothers and sisters, it should be the same in the local church. We see as well of the supremacy of that which was spiritual over that which is material. You see, these people had got their eye on, on heavenly things and eternal things and divine things. This world meant nothing. It meant nothing. They didn't even know whether they'd be here tomorrow. They didn't know when this wave, when the next wave of persecution would come and throw them in prison and even their lives to be taken. They didn't know when their Lord would descend from heaven. They weren't living for this world. It mattered nothing. The spiritual, the eternal was far more important than the material. So what is material? Let's share it with others so that nobody has any lack. And all, the material, all material property was really subservient and secondary to spiritual purpose. That was the aim and object of their heart. That was their passion. Not to, not to amass material things here and earth, but to use what was material to advance a spiritual cause in this world. And we notice in verse 33, we read that there was great grace, great power. And we notice there was great grace at the end of verse 33. Great grace and grace power. Oh, that we might be marked as a church in Oak and Lake. And all the churches represented on this call. Oh, that every one of us would be marked by great power. And oh, that we may be marked by great grace. The evidence of the great power of God and the grace of God operating in our midst. But then at the end of the, the chapter, we're introduced to, to Barnabas. And, and Barnabas is a beautiful guy. You know, and, and, and it says that, that uh, he, he was in uh, verse 36, Barnabas who has by interpretation the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You know, here's Barnabas, and, and this, is the first, this is our introduction to him, the son of consolation, the exhorter, the encourager, the comforter, 
you know, it's the it's the same idea as the Paraclete. You know, the the, the Holy the, another. I will send you another Comforter, the the Paraclete, another of the same kind, the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus is talking about in the upper room ministry, and that's the same word that's used here in relation to Barnabas. He was a Paraclete. He was a he was an advocate. He was a Comforter. He was an exhorter, an encourager. Oh, that we need men and women like Barnabas. Uh, encourage us and exhort us in this day. And he had land. We don't know why he had land because he was a Levite and Levites uh, by law shouldn't have had land, but he had it and he sold it and he laid it at the apostles' feet. And, and you know, that's how chapter four ends. And then chapter five, we're introduced to Ananias and Sapphira in verse one. And, and they decided that they would do what Barnabas did. But the tragedy is that although they did the same thing, they didn't have the same nature and the same character. They weren't of the same type of guy. And Barnabas, no doubt, was a man that was filled with the Holy Spirit. But listen to what it says in verse number three about Ananias, that he wasn't filled with the Spirit, but he was filled by Satan. His heart was filled by Satan. Brothers and sisters, here's the early church. And in chapter four, we've got the opposition from without. And here in chapter five, we've got the opposition from within. And brothers and sisters, that has been the plight of the church right down through the centuries. Opposition from without, but sadly opposition from within. Do you know the thing that has destroyed the church? And the unity of the church and the power of the church and the effectiveness of the church. It's not persecution from without, it's, it's impurity. It's impurity, it's division from within, it's sin from within. You know, there was, there's no church has ever crumbled under persecution. The church in Jerusalem didn't they crumble under persecution in the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah, they were spread, but as they spread, the whole thing multiplied and multiplied. Under persecution, the church in China did, was not, wasn't it crushed, but under persecution by communist China, the church in India, it expanded and grew and multiplied vastly. In Iran, right now, the fastest growing church in the world, they reckon, is in Iran, in the midst of that communist uh, extreme, uh, extreme Islamic regime. The church expands under persecution. And the great problem in the church doesn't come from without. The big church, big problem comes from within. And here we've got here we've got a couple, and they wanted to they wanted to um, pretend that they had the same uh, character and nature as Barnabas, but you know the whole thing was just a, a front. It was just a show. And you know, the reality is that the reality is that they were marked not by generosity, but they were marked by utter and absolute hypocrisy. You know, we think of the selling of the possessions in verse one and two. We think of Satan filling their hearts in verse three. We think of the seriousness of their lie in verse number four. You know, he says, um, uh, Hast thou not, thou hast not lied, end of verse 4, you have not lied to men, but unto God. You know, there's an evidence of the, the deity of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is God. He's divine, he's a divine person, because they'd lied to the Holy Spirit, and now he says, you're lying to God. God, the Holy Spirit. And you know, it was, it was hypocrisy, they were pretending to be something they weren't, they pretended to do something that they hadn't. You know, they weren't asked, they weren't forced to sell their land. They weren't forced to give all the proceeds and lay them at the disciples' feet. They could have kept some for themselves. They could have kept the land for themselves. There was no pressure put upon them, but they just wanted to pretend they were more spiritual than they were, and God judged them. Brothers and sisters, hypocrisy. Is that not just the thing that the Lord Jesus used his strongest language against the religious men of his day. He exposed their hypocrisy. Brothers and sisters, I wonder, we maybe wouldn't do what Ananias and Sapphira did, but I wonder are we marked by that same spirit of deceitful hypocrisy, just pretending we're more spiritual than we are, pretending that we've done things for the Lord that we haven't really done, just putting on a play act, just a pretense and just lying by our lives, pretending before God and before men that we're better than we really are. 
I'm thankful, you know, that God doesn't move in the same severe, solemn judgment, sudden judgment as he moved with in Acts chapter 5. Or who would stand? Who would stand? You know, it's interesting, you know, that, that Peter didn't put a curse on him. Peter, by divine inspiration, he exposed the sin. And God just dealt with it. God just dealt with it. It wasn't a case of Peter saying, you're going to die, perish. No, he just exposed, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Why? Why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart? Why? Why? Because of pride. Because of pride. He wanted people to think better of him. He, wanted, he didn't want someone else getting any kind of glory. He wanted, to, he wanted to pretend that he was as good as Barnabas. Brothers and sisters, sometimes that pride is, fills my heart. And if you're honest, it sometimes fills your heart as well. Sometimes we allow Satan in. The father of lies. You know, Ananias and Sapphira took on the same moral character as the enemy. They became liars. Brothers and sisters, it's possible for us just to take on that same character and just to succumb to Satan as he lifts us up, just as he, he, he promoted pride, just pride was promoted in his own heart, and he promoted pride in the heart of Adam and Eve. And he seeks to promote pride in our hearts as well. And that pretends, that pretends that we're really better than we really are. So we need to take stock of our lives. We need to compare ourselves with Ananias and Sapphira and Barnabas. You know, is it hypocrisy or is it honesty? Is it selflessness or is it selfishness? Is it lying or is it loving? Is it darkness or is it light? And Ananias and Sapphira, they try to hold on to that which is material. In reality, they lost everything. They lost everything. And God moves in judgment. Someone said that the most amazing thing is not the death of Ananias and Sapphira. But in the story, the most amazing thing is the purity of the church that demanded it. Either Ananias and Sapphira must go, or the Holy Spirit must go. There was no room in the early church for both. Such was the purity that marked these early believers. Such was their fervency, their white, hot spirit. That sin must be judged immediately. It must be judged decisively. Someone said that the church fell into solemn and awful awe under the sense of purity. Where the spirit indwells in his full, say, his full sway, the same awe forevermore abides. Sin could not live in the atmosphere of a pure and a holy church. Oh, that we might know something of these early days of church experience. So often, you know, we allow sin to linger in our own hearts, unjudged, undealt with. So often we allow it to go unjudged and undealt with in our local churches. But, you know, the reality is that such was the holiness and purity of the early church that sin couldn't even exist there, that sin was immediately dealt with and a great fear came upon people. And later on, as we'll see next week, that there were people who were even afraid to join themselves to the church, conscious that it wasn't a social thing. It was a spiritual thing. And it was a pure and it was a holy thing. And people were afraid to join the believers, afraid of being exposed afraid of coming under the judgment of a holy and a righteous God. Oh, that we might know something, not only of the power of the, holy ch of the early church, but that we would know something of the purity of the early church of God. Let's pray. Again, our Father, we just bow in your presence. We do give thanks for